all too familiar images. Um, I understand you've even been there, Philip, at Grand Zero. Yes, Have I've you? been there twice. Mm -hmm. The first time was just two weeks after the uh -huh. September 11. Uh -huh. This, this, this is a Spanish lady. I understand her daughter was uh, lost at the attack on the Twin Towers. Seeing this lady and her desperation, um, I guess a question that comes to mind for many is, if there is a God, where is God for a lady in such pain? I think it's important, for one thing, to recognize that God stands against, strongly against that type of act. As Christians, we believe that God's own Son came to earth in the person of Jesus. And in that sense, God really knows what it's like to lose a child to a victim of violence. Just like the woman who reacted that way, God knows what that grief is like. He lost his son, Jesus. So he understands what we are going through. If you want to know how God responds to people in pain, just follow around Jesus as he moves from people who are suffering to other people who are suffering, and you see a very clear picture mm -hmm. of God's concern and help. When you, you say you are, were at Ground Zero two weeks after the c catastrophe, after the, the terrorist attack, what, what impression did you walk away with? Hmm. The smell was still very strong because the, the pile of buildings was about uh, maybe 10 stories high. Uh, and everything was still burning. There were parts that were too hot. The rescuers couldn't even walk. The day I was there, a rumor spread that they had found five firemen alive. Everybody was very excited. It turned out to be a false rumor. They didn't find any firemen alive that day. So the firemen had, had uh, smiles on their faces earlier in the day, and then later in the day they were once again depressed. And uh, I, I was... I was impressed at, at the armies of people that had sprung up to, to help. Why were you there? I was there uh, at the invitation of the Salvation Army, and they were right, right at ground zero. They were doing most of the feeding, and they asked me to come, and I eventually wrote some articles for the Salvation Army magazine. Mm -hmm. as, as terror hits so close to home, Western civilization home, it seems that the picture enlarges and, and we start wondering, um, is there a God in a world capable of such terror? Do you understand that question? Yes, do you, I do. Do you feel for that question? Is there a God capable of such terror? Well, no, I guess... Of allowing it. Yeah, of allowing rather. such terror, yes. Uh, if you look at history, uh, this isn't the only time that we've, people have asked that question. Certainly in the Second World War and the Holocaust, Jews were asking that question. And I remember hearing a rabbi say, people were surprised that I did not lose my faith when I was in the concentration camp. And I turned to them and I said, if I cannot believe, if I do not come out from the camps with a belief in God, what hope do I have? I have to believe in God a God that stands against evil, a God that fights against evil, not necessarily in the, in the quick and easy answer way that we would want him to do, but in a long and slow way of redeeming and opposing the kind of evil that we have seen on September 11. Mm. It, it, it seems like this question, where is God, is, is a, a, a thread through every book that you've ever written. It seems to yeah. come up every every time right. what causes that why is that such a central question in your mind hmm. unlike some of your viewers here in Europe I grew up in a very churched background but it didn't make me a person of faith it made me a person of doubt because the church I grew up in I think misrepresented the world to me it was a very angry legalistic even racist church in the American South and I came to doubt much that the church had told me. I felt a sense of betrayal because when I experienced the world, it was a very different world than had been presented to me in the church. And so my pilgrimage as a Christian has been to go back and, and reclaim territory that had been stained by the church. To, as a writer, I find words that the church had used, but I think now misused. And I've tried to reclaim my faith from the mixed messages that I got in the church that grew up. So I've been on my own search for God. Where is God? Where is God in the midst of the confused messages that the church can give? How did those doubts influence you? Did you become depressed or, or 
I mean, did it have any, any effect in that area? I went through a period of active rebellion where I didn't want to have anything to do with the church and despised the church. So, so I went through that period. And then I learned a helpful hint. Someone told me this one time. Learn to question your doubts as much as you question your faith. And I started doing that. It's, it's easy to be a cynic, to be on the outside, to throw stones. But I started asking myself, okay, what do I have in, as an alternative? What if, if I don't believe in the church, if I don't believe in their presentation of God, what do I believe in? And I found I really didn't have an answer to that question. I didn't have a solid basis of belief. And gradually, I got to know that the problem wasn't so much with God, with the Bible, with Jesus. Rather, it was the distorted image of all of those things that I had, got, I had received in the church of my childhood. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand you were in your 20s when you wrote the book on pain. That's Where's right. Where is God when it hurts? Mm -hmm pretty young. You, you, you say that in your intro, right. to, in your preface to the book as well. Yeah. Um, you've grown older. Yeah. Did you run into suffering yourself? Oh, what very, was it like? very, very much so. And um, another story from childhood. Uh, when I was only one year old, my father had polio. He was completely paralyzed, couldn't even breathe on his own. So they put him in an iron lung machine that breathed for him. The people in his church believed that he would be healed. They all got together and prayed and were so convinced he would be healed that against all the doctor's advice, they had him removed from the iron lung. Within about a week, 10 days, he died. And my whole life has been lived under... How the, old were you? I was one year old. But the effect on my mother, the effect on others in our church, I grew up under this shadow of people who made a mistake, a theological mistake, because they thought this was God's will and they were wrong. So, you know, that's, that's an issue of, of pain in my family that has had ramifications all of my life from childhood on. Mm -hmm. at, at, at what point did you, did you, did the suffering of that mistake become real poignant in your life? Mm -hmm. I think it became poignant in childhood as I saw the effect of it on my mother. She was a, a, a young widow with two boys to raise with no easy way to uh, have an income. And uh, why did this pain happen? Why did the suffering happen? Well, it, it, it was because she got a wrong message from the church. And I'm sure she had uh, anger against God. She had a hard time admitting that, but a feeling of disappointment with God. And in anyone who has been through a tragedy like that, like the woman we saw who collapsed, uh, you want to, you, you ask those questions. You can't help asking those questions. And those are the questions that I heard all through childhood growing up that later, as a writer, I was able to take apart, analyze, and explore. You're right. I did write this book when I was very young. About 15 years later, I went back and revised it. I had heard from many people, many readers, and I went back and included everything I had learned since I wrote it. Mm -hmm. What happened to your church? Is it... Did it change? It's still there? Funny thing happened. About two years ago, I went to the final service of that church. We called it the burial of the church. It had moved twice since I had attended it. Every time black people, African Americans, would move into the neighborhood, the church would move further out. And then they would move into that neighborhood, and the church would move further out. You see, they never allowed people of black color to attend. Well, finally, they, finally there was nowhere else to move. And God does have a sense of humor because they sold the building to an African-American denomination, to a black denomination. And I attended the final service, a few little shriveled, kind of angry, uptight white people going out of business. And they're turning this building over to a very lively co uh, congregation. The building rocks again. The music is better and the spirit is back. <laughs> do, do you feel that you've come, come any closer to an answer? because the question keeps coming back. <laughs> well, my last book, which I think you have on the table here, is Soul Survivor, How My Faith Survived the Church. And I think uh, that's been an important part of my own pilgrimage, to separate God from the church. A lot of people get those confused. They think that the image of God they hear in church, which is often a very stern, angry, judgmental God, is 
who God is, but I have found that's not who God is at all. In fact, the best picture we have uh, as Christians of what God is like is by looking at Jesus. And Jesus was a person who had special tenderness and mercy toward the losers of society, toward the moral failures. Jesus reached out to them. That's not that judgmental, harsh God that I was raised under. Mm. As you said, the, the subtitle of your book, Soul Survivors, How My Faith Survived the Church. Can you describe some scenes that you, that you, of your childhood? What was this church like? What, what was so bad about it? Uh, we were taught that people of other races were inferior. They were cursed by God, much like the apartheid system in South Africa. The white people were on the top. Uh, Martin Luther King was in my hometown, Atlanta, Georgia, but he was an enemy. We saw him as, a, as not a prophet, but as, a, as the enemy. Well, later, I was deeply affected by Martin Luther King. In fact, one of the chapters in that book is about him. But I would say what brought me back to God was discovering the goodness of this world. Nature, the beauties of nature, classical music, and romantic love. Those are the three things that, that softened me. There's a statement from the British journalist G.K. Chesterton who said, the worst moment for an atheist is when he feels a profound sense of gratitude and has no one to thank. Mm. And that's where I felt. That's the place I found myself in. And I wanted to find the God who created a world of so much beauty mm. and goodness. What, what would you describe as the crisis in your life, the, the major, the hardest point? Mm. Can, can you paint, I can. tell me that story? I, you know, the word gospel, I don't know what the equivalent is in Dutch, but the word gospel in English means good news. But to a lot of people raised in the church, they don't think of the gospel, God's message, as good news. Mm -hmm. It sounds like bad news. It sounds like something that will scold them, that will make them feel worse. The crisis for me was that I heard the gospel as mostly bad news, a negative message, something judging me, something what? making me feel bad. When, when was it? How young That would have you? been uh, growing up and in high school and even in college days. Mm -hmm. And it was only later that I realized I had, I had gotten a, mis a distorted version of the gospel, that it really is good news. It's in, for in people what area who was it distorted, apart from the racial uh, issue? Oh, I think just the, that... Old Testament, judgmental, angry God. I saw God as something like a librarian, always going around, shh, now be quiet, be quiet, stop doing that. And not someone who actually loved those who were moral failures. How were you then as a, uh, an adolescent teenager with that kind of an image of God? Were you a rebel? Yes, I was. I, uh, did you fight God? I did fight God, and I definitely didn't like didn't want to be like those Christians that I spent so much time among in church. And I found, as I got to know Jesus, I found that he had a hard time with religious people too, that, that it was their very pride and their uh, self-righteousness that bothered Jesus so much. He seemed to, to be a lot happier among the moral outcasts because mm -hmm. God's gospel is good news for those who have failed. Mm -hmm. And any other clash moments? Did you remember? For me, a lot of those windows that opened my mind were through books, through literature. And I think that's probably why I became a writer. Because I, I didn't know intelligent Christians, for example, uh, but through people like C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton, I learned that there are people who have struggled with the same issues that I was struggling with and yet end up on the other side as people of faith, people who indeed believe in God. And long distance through books, they helped me in my own struggling faith. And I hope in the same way maybe I can do that mm -hmm. for some people now as a mm -hmm. writer, writing about many of the same issues. Let's, let's go back to the, the church. Um, you are still a church member, I am. aren't you? Yes. Why? I don't believe I have much option. There's a, there's a statement from one of the early church fathers who said, if you take a coal away from the fire, it grows cold. And I think that's true of those of us who are believers as well. If you try to do it on your own, you, you, you usually will lose the heat. You will grow cold. I find that I need 
to be close to others, even though it can be uncomfortable, even though I disagree with them, may not like a lot of the things that they say, yet I need that community mm. uh, to balance my own life. I, I need to be around people of different ages. I need to be around people of diverse economics and diverse races uh, to realize that God is a lot bigger than just me and my experience. I see the way God works in the world through other people as well as myself. It, the, looking at the church and, and especially looking at your story, your, your history with the church, it seems that the church is such a poor representation of what God should stand for. Mm. Some would even say the church is God's PR problem. <laughs> Why would God choose to have a church like most churches are, represent yeah. him yeah. on earth? Well, you can look at that two ways. You can either look on it as kind of God's great mistake. I, I look on it as God's great act of humility to entrust his own reputation of what God is like to people like us. There was a period of time where he entrusted his reputation of what God is like to his son Jesus, which gave a perfect reflection of what God is like. But Jesus said, I, I didn't come uh, for myself alone. I came for you because I am turning over this mission to you, those of you who are followers of me. And for most people in the world, the only way that they're going to know what God is like is by encountering a follower of Jesus. That's a heavy responsibility for us. And I think a great act of humility on God's part to give his reputation to the likes of us. You, you weren't probably always this sure about faith in the church, right. seeing the questions you've been asking in right. your books. Are all these doubts a thing from the past now? <laughs> my last book was how my faith survived the church, so no. Um, I'm just a, I can't help doubting. I've convinced, I'm convinced that people have different faith personalities in the same way they have different personalities. Some people are introverts, some people are extroverts. Some people have a very secure faith. They don't spend a lot of time asking questions and wondering. I'm not one of those people. I'm a person who every day when I wake up, I, I have to ask myself again, do I really believe this? Well, the way I work out my doubts is by writing books about them. I, I write books generally to reflect what's going on inside me. And probably all the books that I write will have that thread of questioning. Again, I came back to faith because of my doubts. To me, doubt is a good thing because it made me doubt some of the, the lies that the church taught me growing up. Um, to many, yet to many, prayer seems futile. Hmm. Faith seems futile because they find the heavens impenetrable and uh, God either does not seem to hear or does not seem to care f to give an answer to their prayers. Um, why does God prove so hard to find? Hmm. I wrote a book called Reaching for the Invisible God, which I think is available here in the Netherlands. And sometimes people ask me, well, why does God make himself invisible? And my response to that is, well, he doesn't make himself invisible. He is invisible. He's a spirit. And occasionally he has made himself visible. We see these stories in the Old Testament. We see these stories in Jesus. And then I believe we see it in the church. God is making himself visible. That's what we are called to do to demonstrate what God is like. So it's not like God mm -hmm. is... So he, he, he makes himself visible through the church. Through, through the children. church and then through his son Jesus. So it's not like God makes a choice, oh, I think I'm going to go hide. It's just that we live on planet Earth uh, with flesh, with, with material, you know, with atoms, with molecules. God lives in a different dimension. He is a spiritual being. And yet, I and uh, millions of people throughout history would attest to the fact that we can relate to God. We can have a direct spiritual connection with God. He's not going to appear to us like our friend, like our mother, like our wife or husband, but he is a spiritual being who, who does promise a direct spiritual contact with us. But he could do us. that. I mean, wouldn't it make things so much easier and maybe even better to, for some of us, if God would just simply choose to be the God we expect him to be, yeah. a God who answers in thunder and lightning and performs miracles and, and things like that. You would think so. But if you read the stories in the Bible, it didn't happen that way. In the, in the time when the Israelites were wandering through the desert, God was visible. 
there was thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai. You could tell exactly what God wanted by following the cloud, by following the fire. Do we look back on that time as a time of great faith? No, it was a time of great rebellion and childishness. There may not have been any Jewish atheists in those days, but there weren't many faithful followers of God in those days. They all ended up dying in the desert. When Jesus himself was, was on earth, he said, even if someone rose from the dead, you still would not believe. And that proved true because Jesus himself rose from the dead. Some believed, but many did not. So I, even though God doesn't act the way we may want him to, even if he did act that way, people wouldn't necessarily believe. Faith mm -hmm. is difficult. It's always going to be a challenge, and it's never going to be easy. Did you yourself not, at some point, struggle with God uh, on, on this issue? Lord, why, are you, uh, why aren't you clear? Why aren't you giving me a straight answer right now? Sure. Yeah, I did and do. And sometimes I'm invited to speak on college campuses. And I, when I speak on college campuses, I like to choose the most skeptical, the most rebellious people, the kids who are reading newspapers instead of listening, and speak to them. And I tell them this. I tell them, I challenge you to find a single argument against God in the great atheists, David Hume, Bertrand Russell, uh, Voltaire, people like that, that is not already included in the Bible. I can find in Psalms, in Ecclesiastes, in, Le in Jeremiah, in Habakkuk. I can find every argument against God in the book of Job, for example, that these great philosophers have used against God. And I have come to respect a God that gives us the ammunition that we can use against him. So I have no problem with people who are angry, people who are quarreling, people who are searching. God seems to understand that. In fact, he included that pattern in his sacred scriptures. I've come to respect a God that doesn't force us to believe in him, but gives us some evidence and even gives us the arguments that we can use to disbelieve in him. I respect that kind of so God. So is that, is that kind of the reason why you feel God takes the approach he seems to be taking? He's not going to kind of falsely influence us into a decision by impressing us? Yes, I do. Uh, it goes back to the, to the temptation where Jesus was being tempted to do these dazzling acts, turn rocks into bread, to jump off a building, to do things to impress people. And Jesus never responded in that way. He never, he never did a miracle like a magician so that people would be impressed. He didn't want that kind of faith. He wanted a different kind of faith. People who voluntarily, without pressure, without manipulation, chose to follow him, even though often it's harder rather than easier. Some of the things I'm required to care about as a Christian, the poor, uh, the environment, these are things that make my life harder, not easier. Mm. I'm not allowed to have just a life of self-indulgence. I have to care about other people, people who aren't as blessed and, and uh, don't have as many resources as I do. Thank you, Philip. My pleasure. We can help converse about whatever. We're not going to stay.